Welcome, I think we'll get started. So again, this is an informal event, so please feel free during our discussion to get up and help yourselves to more snacks and drinks. Um, my name is Jennifer Gottwald. I'm a senior licensing manager at WARF, and this is one of the many um, programming forums that WARF hosts, um, the Wisconsin Clean Tech Network Forum. This is the second part of a two-part series we've been doing on advocacy around clean energy. Last month, we had Scott Coonan, who's actually here today from the Wisconsin Conservative Energy Forum, and Scott Blankman, who I haven't had a chance to see if he could make it, um, from Clean Wisconsin. And we had a really, really good discussion about what groups like um, the Wisconsin Conservative Energy Forum do and Clean Wisconsin, who they represent, and what their goals are. And then I think the two Scots actually came up with some really good areas of um, bipartisan and general agreement for clean energy in Wisconsin. Um, they talked about some of the main takeaways from that. And Scott, you can correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong. As far as policy goes, Wisconsin's been kind of quiet on um, policy change regarding clean energy, which you can see is both a good thing and a bad thing at any different time. There are different arguments for different political leanings around why um, clean energy and clean tech and sustainability is important, but the result can be the same if we know what arguments to use with which groups. Wisconsin is an incredibly um, heterogeneous state in some ways that affect these policies and that we have rural areas, we have urban areas, we have different concerns among farmers and people trying to commute within our large cities and that utilities definitely play an important role in all of this, and that some are moving without policy to some extent towards more sustainable efforts because it makes more business sense. Uh, we concluded by saying, you know, this is an event on the UW-Madison campus and we've got innovators involved, that there's definitely a need for innovation um, in storage, that infrastructure is going to be um, needing replacing and that um, innovation can play a big part in all of that. So one of the other things that was mentioned in this discussion was an announcement by Governor Tony Evers in August that um, a goal and a state office that were set up to um, achieve the goal that Wisconsin will be carbon neutral by 2050. And this is a big statement on um, behalf of Governor Evers' administration. So we're really, really, really happy today to have Secretary Joel Brennan, the Secretary of the Department of Administration under the um, Governor Evers' um, group, um, talking about um, what the uh, the government side of this um, and what's going on with Governor Evers' initiative, how he's involved and such. So I'm just going to say very briefly and then we'll let Secretary Brennan um, introduce himself further. He's got a long career in public policy. He um, has done a lot of this in Milwaukee. He was promoting Milwaukee and um, policy around um, Visit Milwaukee, their Visitor and Convention Bureau. He also worked with Milwaukee's Redevelopment Authority and most recently was at Discovery World in Milwaukee where he did a lot of initiatives around education and reaching different groups and policies around science education. So with that, uh, please welcome Secretary Joel Brennan and we'll start the conversation. Thank you. So to start off with, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your current position, especially as it's related to clean tech and clean energy? Sure. Um, I appreciate having the chance to be here today. Um, and it's uh, Laura is somebody who I, I had a chance to work with when I was at Discovery World. So it's actually coming back to some of my comfort zone of people who are involved in STEM education, who are involved in science, technology, and innovation, because that's really what I spent a lot of time doing in the last 10 years of my career. Uh, just a little, a brief bio. Um, I, I grew up in Milwaukee. I am the uh, 10th of 12 children, actually the 11th of 12 children, I guess I would call myself. Um, my, my father was born to a single mother in Manitowoc, Wisconsin in 1927. Uh, he ended up having a half brother. Uh, my mom was an only child who was born in Milwaukee and spent her uh, early years between Milwaukee and East Troy. They got together, they had 12 kids. You know, who's, who's to know, how, how does that happen? Uh, but it was the, they, they started in the roaring 50s and they got to the early 70s. And so you could tell what end I'm, I am of that. Um, and grew up in and around uh, Milwaukee, went to Marquette University. Um, and one of the things that really shaped my career a lot is when I was 
um, at Marquette University be, between my sophomore and junior year. I spent a summer as an intern in Washington, D.C., working for a member of Congress. I was a political science major and an English major as an undergrad. Um, and that just kind of whetted my appetite for public policy. Um, right after college, I went to work for a member of Congress, was involved in various parts of uh, the legislative process for several years, including, um, spend, we're not going to talk about it today, but spending a little time as a beer lobbyist. So I'm also comfortable when people have drinks and they want to have conversations like this. Uh, and, the, and eventually worked uh, in redevelopment, economic development at the local level, and for 10 years prior to this job, um, had been working as the CEO of uh, the Science and Technology Center in Milwaukee. And I, I still live in Milwaukee. Um, I'm one of about a, a quarter of the cabinet um, who lives outside of Madison but uh, commutes to work here. Most of us who do that are from Milwaukee um, and spend a good amount of time around the state. In fact, I was, uh, in, I was in Racine last night in Wisconsin Rapids this morning. Um, and the part of my job, and the Department of Administration really is the, the part of the cabinet that uh, our constituency is the rest of government. So it's the governor's office, it's the other uh, cabinet agencies, it's the legislature, and we do, we're the, the only uh, agency that really has efforts that we do enterprise-wide. So um, if you're the Department of Transportation, you have a pretty specific constituency. For us, we do all of the human resources across the whole enterprise, a lot of the information technology work. We, um, the state owns 6,700 properties, buildings, and, and other properties around the state, so we do that. The state budget office is within the Department of Administration. We, uh, on behalf of the governor, undertake intergovernmental relations with the tribes around the state. Uh, we manage Indian gaming and regulate that as part of the Department of Administration. So it's, it's got a wide variety, including um, we do some things related to energy, housing, and community resources. And that's probably the area most specifically where it uh, starts to get into clean energy and, and clean tech and some of the stuff we're going to talk about today. But it's a, it really is a, a broad, it's a fascinating place um, because it's a, a very broad experience and a broad set of issues that we get to work on. So um, intellectually, uh, it's a fascinating place. Um, and I'm somebody, I guess I've always considered myself, and you didn't go through my whole resume, but over 25 years, there's probably been seven or eight jobs, which maybe means I can't keep a job for very long, or, or maybe have the ability, uh, or have had an opportunity to work on things that are a mile wide and, and not that deep. Um, but it's a great way to be able to, to probe lots of those different issues, and there's lots of crossover into different places. And, and that's um, thematically one of the things that the governor brought when he came to office was his mantra of connecting the dots and making sure that agencies aren't working in silos but have an opportunity to work together. And so, you know, as we get into the discussion, I think that's part of what hopefully we're going to talk about today. Great. Thanks so much. And just to let everyone know, I have some questions I'm going to go through to kind of set the stage here, but um, we uh, will open it up to audience questions pretty soon because I want to make this a full discussion with everybody as well. Okay. So what exactly did Governor Evers announce about carbon neutrality back in August? Well, uh, the executive order number 38 uh, calls for 100 percent carbon-free energy or electricity by 2050. So it sets that goal. Um, and it also established the Office of uh, Clean Energy and Sustainability that would be housed within the Department of Administration. So really those two things that are complementary and they, they serve really the same goal. Um, and, and part of what this is is um, an effort to try to get Wisconsin back to a point of leadership. Um, going back. 20 years, I think, in about 1998, and this was during the Thompson administration, Wisconsin was the first of the Midwest states to set the renewable energy goal of, I think it was 10% by 2015. And then we was able to achieve that goal. It was revisited in some way in the early 2000s. We haven't touched it since. Um, and I think the, I listened, I wasn't here for it, but I got to listen to um, some of the conversation over the, uh, in the, the first session you did associated with this. And, um, and you made note of it as well, that um, 
on, on one side, you might have said that it was status quo um, uh, over the last eight to eight or eight years or so. Um, some would say we've done nothing, and it's there, it's high time that we get back to doing some of the things that made Wisconsin a leader um, over time, and some of the things that I think there is some pent up demand and energy for. So, so really, what the the governor laid out there, and and it, originally these were things that were included in the governor's budget proposal back in February. The legislature. Uh, removed these and removed any number of items that also had, whether it was uh, returning some more of the scientists to DNR, there were positions in there that were taken out. There was a uh, $4 million of grants related to clean energy that was also removed by the legislature. So it's an opportunity to try to exercise um, the executive branch's authority to do some of these things and, and to help bring the legislature along. I think it's in, um, uh, the, I think industry is heading there, certainly the electorate and people are heading there. Um, the legislature sometimes is the, uh, not the earliest of the adopters to this. Okay, so and when you were, um, or the governor's team was researching all of this, you indicated that we seem to have fallen behind in our leadership position in some of these things. So how, were you comparing Wisconsin clean energy policies to those of surrounding states, other states in the Midwest? Where are we in that, and uh, where do we want to be? Well, I, I think if, you know, in this place, um, I, I don't know that anybody ever gets into uh, public service wanting to be anything other than at the top and, and to be seen as a leader. And uh, just in the last few weeks, there was a, uh, is it the Environmental Policy Law Center, uh, did a comparison of where Wisconsin is versus Minnesota, and it got some attention. Um, and I, excuse me, I may get some of these statistics wrong, but. Um, in about in in the early 2000s, we were kind of on a par with where Minnesota was. Um, uh, since that time, Minnesota has five times as much wind as we do, 16 times as much solar. Uh, Wisconsin's ranked in the you know 41st for solar and 25th for wind or something like that, whereas Minnesota's in the top 15. And um, and this is a state of the you know same population, roughly same economic makeup or very similar economic makeup. Um, and and in, in addition to the comparative statistics, I think the acknowledgement that a lot of what has happened in Wisconsin over the last several years can be considered ad hoc, uh, disjointed. And I think part of the uh, the impetus for us in this administration and, and what the governor and, and the lieutenant governor uh, want to do too, because this is an area I think of real passion for him, is we want to get back on a track, not to just compare ourselves to our neighbors to the West, but how do we compare nationally and how do we get to a point where we are leading? The governor just spent uh, time a few weeks ago in Japan and um, uh, you know he will go on other trade missions and will spend time you know, comparing us not only to our neighbors in the Midwest, which is easy, but how do we compare ourselves in a global economy and how we're attracting, retaining talent and, and doing the things in a place that has such creativity and innovation, you know, like this, uh, the Morgridge Center here and, and the whole university. How do we uh, energize those things and activate those things so that, uh, that we can get the most out of them? And, and I think, uh, uh, Objectively, we have not gotten there over the last decade. Okay, so those were some of the things that went into bringing about this um, order and goal. Um, you mentioned both wanting to be number one, obviously, and leading in all of these things. You mentioned uh, trade missions, international trade missions, which to me is thinking, of course, in addition to looking at business and commerce, you're probably looking at other things on those missions, all of our government officials, such as clean energy or many other well, the things. The governor noted that he, on one of the trips, he took the bullet train you know, back and forth. You know, we could we could have a discussion about. Uh, I, I and I tell you, I, I drive seventy five miles back and forth between Milwaukee and Madison. Some of you may remember there was supposed to be a train uh, and about nine hundred and twelve million billion dollars, nine hundred twelve million dollars that we could have had for that. But that's a that's a discussion topic yeah. for a different day. 
So, but what other areas, uh, how else did this come about? What other um, aspects went into looking at especially clean energy? So well, we want to be leadership. Um, we uh, want to lead in the world as well. We want to make, we want to attract talent and make our state very attractive to a lot of important people coming in to keep the state vibrant. What else goes into but it's this? A, I think it's also, it's a matter where, um, in some ways, industry is is inevitably leading the way towards this, and local units of government are also doing this. So there are uh, 125 or so uh, cities in Wisconsin that have pledged to be 25% uh, renewables by 2025. And the state had been a partner in those efforts for a, a long time and had been moving forward, and that effort, those efforts have stopped. And so uh, how can the state be a partner alongside those? Because even though uh, I think a lot of local units of government would argue that the state has not necessarily held up its end of the bargain as a partner in terms of shared revenue and some other resources, they're still finding ways to be innovative at the local level. There are, um, there are utilities that have set similar, if not the same goals as the governor has set. Um, and so, you know, it's inevitable and, and industry is heading in that direction too. It's just, it's how we get there. Uh, it was instructive to me. I was in Manitowoc about a month ago and I was, um, I had a meeting with um, a company. It's a family owned company that's been in business for 110 years. It's an aluminum foundry and they have been very successful uh, for that 110 years and they employ a significant number of people in the community and uh, they're, they have a great customer base but their customer base is almost entirely fossil fuel based. And so this is a company, they want to do the right thing. They, they know what's coming in industry and their, their ask of the state of Wisconsin was, okay, we want to do this. How can you help us get there? What is it? We're a forward-looking, forward-thinking employer that wants to do right and, and be strong and good and valuable employees for the next generation. What is it that we can do together to prepare for that? And I think their industry is looking in the same way that the state is about what the future looks like. We don't have, we don't always get great examples of this at every level of government. I won't spend a lot of time, waste a lot of breath on what I'm talking about there. But, but you know, at the at this, the level of Wisconsin and here as a state, um, what is it that we can do to be the right kind of partner? And I think that that's the charge the governor has given us uh, on the administration side, and and I think it's one that um, that that industry wants to hear from us as well. So that's a great segue, um, not to put you on the spot, but did you have an answer for this company or do you have other answers of direct actions coming out of this goal um, that are either in play or are going to be in play? Well, um, I think uh, for the most part, a lot of what we're going to have to do is make incremental progress. I didn't have the right answer for that, uh, that particular employer except that <laughs> Um, that they are absolutely right that it's time for the state to, to be there in that conversation with them. The things that the state can have more direct control over, I think we are starting to do. One of the, one of the areas within the state budget that was, uh, I think lots of people held up as one of the areas that was a strength of the budget and something that um, it was in some ways overdue was the fact that we, uh, we approved about $1.8 billion worth of uh, funding in the capital budget. And that's for, I mentioned the state has 6,700 properties and, and that includes the UW system around the state. So of this $1.8 billion, about half of that is going into UW system projects, half is going into state projects. And um, be between now, and, and that was, that's almost double what had been spent uh, in the previous couple of capital budgets. There had been kind of this arbitrary uh, billion dollar level that had been set. And, and you have, for those of you who went to um, a, a UW system university, you have lots of uh, buildings that were built in the 1950s, 60s, early 70s, a lot of them coming of age at the same time. And there's kind of a, a pent up demand about what you do to make sure those are ready and useful and, and be able to be centers of innovation for the next 50 years. And the state hadn't done a lot on there. And so we were able to do that. Um, 
we didn't have a new set of standards ready for this capital budget. We will between now and the, the next capital budget, which will have much more of a clean energy, clean technology focus on them. But, and this is I think something that industry understands, even the existing projects that are on the books now, with a, enough time to plan, it doesn't always um, have a, a, a huge impact, a huge delta on the expense of the project. It's, and sometimes, in some ways, it's just the planning of that and the execution of it that, that is the, the thing that uh, can stand in your way. So I think we're, we're trying as we can to be leaders on this. Um, one, there are, I think the, the number is about 76,000 clean energy jobs in Wisconsin, give or take, at this point. Um, uh, 90 percent of those jobs have something to do with energy efficiency and so kind of the the low-hanging fruit or one of the ways that the state can come back to being a leader is to look at all of those state building projects and, and how can we do that it you know you do right by employers there there's economic opportunity there's sustained economic opportunity by doing that and it's the right thing to do and so you know so we can get back to some of the leadership aspects of that i think by by uh, in, engaging in some of those things okay so you've alluded to this a few times but by stating this goal it's a way to kind of tell the legislature that this is an area that this administration wants to go into so do you have um bipartisan support for some of these efforts and if so, what are they? And if not, how can we foster that? Yeah, uh, I think that there is a, there are certainly are members of the uh, majority party in the legislature who have voiced interest in this. Um, some of the specific things that we're doing that are also budget related, um, there is a, uh, a settlement uh, from VW, from Volkswagen. It, it started out as about 70, um, 60 or 70 million dollars. There's about $40 million left of that. And in the budget, the, it was separated into um, some electric vehicle charging stations and then uh, some uh, bu buses that we could do around the state. And I have gotten um, input from Republican legislators who are very interested in the electric charging stations and siting of those and, and how can we move forward in, in having a network of those around the state because I think they see the inevitability of that. And that's a positive. Um, on the other hand, I remember I was, uh, I, I read either the Cap Times or the State Journal, it was a day or two after the, the governor introduced his budget where he had the 100% uh, the goal in the budget and the head of the WMC had an, uh, an op-ed and you would have thought that we declared World War III. And, you know, and, and there are members of the WMC who are helping lead that charge, members of the organization that have very similar stated goals. And I, I talked to Kurt Bauer about this afterwards, and I had talked to members uh, of utilities who are moving in this direction. I said, you know, hyperbole is something that maybe we can, we can have a, a, a useful discussion on these things, but automatically jumping into a place where you're declaring that this is going to be terrible for business. And, and you know, I understand there's politics associated with this, but, but sometimes that gets in the way of useful dialogue and really making progress. And so I still think we have to, um, we have to kind of tone down the rhetoric sometimes because it's inevitable of, of where things are going. And I think almost everyone, you know, the electorate understands that, uh, the administration hopefully understands that, I think industry understands it, and I think the legislature is getting there, but they need to come along with us. Okay, so finally, another question I wanted to ask is, you talk about um, extensive travel, and I'm guessing other members of the administration are traveling quite a bit too. What kind of feedback are you getting on this goal from different parts of the state? Well, as I said, there's uh, there are a number of uh, communities around the state that have already set sustainability targets on their own. We, we spend somewhere between 12 or 14 billion dollars outside of Wisconsin to bring fossil fuel into Wisconsin every year. And, and I don't think that there's anyone who would argue that, that uh, having clean, reliable energy sources here would be a much more, and investing in those things is a much more valuable way to, to sustain us and have long-term economic benefit from that. So, so there is, I think, um, there is leadership that's happening. I think there are 
Uh, there are five communities that have set even higher goals, uh, La Crosse, Eau Claire, Middleton, Monona, uh, one other, well, Madison, I guess would be the other one. Um, but, but there are, um, I, you know, so there are, and they are of, amongst 125 or 127 state, uh, cities around the country to do this. So, so there's leadership happening at the local level. And uh, again, it, not, it doesn't always have to be driven from the state government. We simply have to find the ways to invest alongside our partners who are doing the right thing. I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you happen to know if those cities that do have these types of goals, besides ones you just talked about, are they distributed throughout the state? Um, they are, and, and this is um, one of the great things about this. There, uh, there are examples large and small of communities that are doing innovative things. Um, I'm gonna, I may get this wrong, uh, but uh, Megan gave me an example from Judah in Greene County, um, where a group of Madison students came and worked with the school district to save uh, upwards of $100,000 on, uh, and in the end it was photovoltaic panels, I think, that they used some, you know, so, and this is a, I never heard of Judah, Wisconsin before, maybe some of you had, but there's examples of communities that small, um, and it's also uh, the, the nexus of all of the great talent and innovation and the innovative spirit of a place like UW-Madison being then transported to a place where it can have benefit to the community, demonstrable benefit on the, on the uh, economic side, but then you also have a group of students who were engaged in the project at the school level who are, are moved along that path as well. And that, I guess that's one thing I'd say about where Wisconsin has to be and, and has, to, uh, has to go moving forward. In the last few weeks, many of you probably have also seen that we have a, a huge demographic challenge in Wisconsin. There are, you know, a lot, and, and this is not uh, just to Wisconsin, but it's in some ways amplified a little bit here, where you have far more people leaving the workforce that are in that zero to 15 age who are gonna be entering over the next 10 years. And so we're going to have to do things that uh, attract and retain and make sure that those people will either come here or stay here. And that's a generation that cares a lot more about sustainability than some of the people who will be leaving the workforce. And so Wisconsin can't afford not to be leading on these things if we're going to be an attractive place to, to you know, live, work, play, raise your family. And that, that goes to the universities and the work that's going on in the universities. But it's every employer, no matter where you go around the state, the, the biggest uh, complaint they have is workforce challenges. And if we're going to continue to, uh, or at least try to embrace those or beat those in the coming years, I think sustainability, clean energy, and, and doing things the right way is going to have to be part of that message to attract those kind of people. Makes sense. I want to open it up. Does anyone in the audience have questions at this point? Yes. Yeah, um, you described Wisconsin's fall vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Minnesota in energy uh, issues. You described it very charitably as saying it was related to the ad hoc practices of a previous administration. I guess my question is this. Um, to what extent uh, should the previous administration be blamed for a lot of the things that have happened in the past several years? I mean, you mentioned things like the uh, spurning of the, the offer of aid for trains and I'm also thinking of things like uh, the incompetence in LEADEC, the waste of money there, um, Foxconn, which many people choose to spell with just one end for a variety of uh, reasons, and you know the appointment of 20-somethings 20 as division administrators. I mean, to what extent are these issues that have to be overcome now by new administration? Um, I guess. To, for the most part, I think those things are dealt with in the course of a campaign. And, uh, and um, voters had the ability to, to see the good and the, what, what people would have seen were the good and the bad of the Walker administration. And, um, and, and 30,000 more Wisconsin voters chose the, the, the Evers path versus continuing on a, a third term of the Walker path. But, and, and you know, I'd like to say, uh, that what you do on day one is you just kind of wipe the slate clean and you start over. However, you know, you're always, 
there's always the legacy of what you what has come before you that you're going to have to deal with. And so, you know, in some of those cases, uh, we're still working on lots of those issues. Um, but in the end, I, I think when it comes down to it, residents in the state get to vote for the governor every four years. They would like for there to be a very pragmatic approach in between those times. Ideology is, you know, is great during the election season. Um, economic growth is not something that necessarily knows partisan or ideological bounds. So, so I think we've got to do things the right way. And, and as it pertains specifically to clean energy and uh, clean technology and innovation, there is so much that's happening here in this state. And if we hit the, the, the pause button as a state over the last several years, or we weren't aggressive enough, we need to make up for lost time. So I'm less interested in, in casting blame at the people who came before than how can we marshal the right resources? Because you know, we are really at the, front, at the forefront of this. If there's a message I think we have for people here at the university or at the, the, the entire system, um, there is plenty of room for collaboration and I hope we will, and we want to portray a spirit of collaboration. You know, I mean, I, I would tend to agree with a lot of the things you said, but there's, there's a Republican majority in the legislature and if we really want to make systemic change, we're not going to uh, get a lot by just kind of lobbing grenades over the wall at each other. At some point, we have to be the, the adults in the room and try to get stuff, get, really get stuff accomplished. You want to say something, Scott? Uh, just another question. Yep. Um, so I guess I'm uh, wondering um, what specifics or uh, what specifics you can share with the group, or how do you envision the role of the um, Office of Clean Energy and Sustainability, I guess, going forward, and you know what what specifics you might be able to share with us? Yeah. Well, it's it's really it's still in its uh, formative stages. And I, I made a little bit of mention of this, but, but a person who's going to be really deeply engaged and involved in this and who already has uh, over the course of the last several months is the lieutenant governor. So um, as administrations go, oftentimes the lieutenant governor will find a, an area of passion that he or she wants to work with. In the prior administration, homelessness was one of the areas in which the, the lieutenant governor was directly involved. And so uh, the lieutenant governor has been involved in interviews and discussions about the, the formulation of the office. Um, there is a, a group of, Megan, can you remind me the name again of the office that has been at the PSC now? Office of Energy Innovation, which has been around since the early 1970s, since the, the energy crisis of the 70s, and has been doing some terrific work, has uh, did, did about $5 million of grants all around the state for um, specific energy uh, innovative projects in the last six months. And so there's uh, any number of ways in which we can leverage those resources as well. So, so as much as anything, this is an attempt to, to try to um, put all of the resources into one place and marshal those resources across the enterprise so that, um, that it's not disparate and it's not kind of, uh, if, again, if there was a criticism of things being ad hoc, still good things being done, but not being done in as universal a, a matter as possible. There's a, a group that I've had a chance to work a little bit with um, based in Milwaukee called MWORK, the Midwest Energy Research Consortium um, that has significant uh, involvement from industry, from the battery power control, you know, lots of the, the innovative companies that have been around here um, in Wisconsin for 100 years. This is an, the office, and I think uh, the administration can play a very direct role with them in, in just advancing some of the work that they're doing. But when it comes down to the tactics of this, I think some of that is still to be determined as we get uh, going and as we're able to figure out kind of all the, the resources that are being brought to bear and some of the feedback we're going to get from, uh, from our collaborative partners in this. Okay. You had a question, ma'am? Yeah, sorry. Say, you've been driving all over the state. It's 
sold to the doll because that dream got sold. Among other reasons. Um, how are we going to get further, faster than that goal? Because it's not enough. No, I, and and um, I could, and. Unfortunately, I think that um, when you change an administration and you start to change things, you, you look at things, I, I look at things through the lens of incremental progress. Um, however, on things like the global climate crisis, I agree with you. I'm not sure that incremental progress is enough. Um, I, the, the only way that, the, the way that we can go faster, uh, further faster is continuing change of public opinion on this, I think. Um, and, and so, and I've seen, you know, in degrees, um, and despite what's happened in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, you know, some embarrassing things that leaders in this country have done for very young global leaders uh, when it comes to the climate change and, and these issues, um, there, I have seen evidence of some changes in the way that the public views this issue. I, I think all of us need to be able to call this what it is and to be able to, you know, on a place like this or in a place like this, make sure that we are uh, believing what the science tells us and, and you know, and acting accordingly. Um, but I guess we are gonna do as much as we can within the, the, the limitations that we have. And, and that may not be good enough, um, for some, it may be too much for others, but we are trying to forge a path where we can get there as, as much as we can, as soon as we can. So I've got a quick follow-up to that. We have, you were on the UW-Madison campus. Do you, how can UW researchers um, help with that education piece? How can they join with um, the governor to kind of get the word out about um, the need for everybody to kind of think more deeply about these issues, form their opinion, and act accordingly? Well, there's, there's some of that that's already happening. Um, I have not had the pleasure of meeting, but I think someone who's, who's known as the father of the microgrid works here, Professor Lassiter, uh, mm -hmm. maybe has been at the UW. And, and so there's, there's already innovation happening. Uh, one of the issues, and I think it came up, Scott, in the conversation you guys were having, and, and you made note of it, that reliability when it comes to solar and wind has always been one of the, the points that has hampered things. And so um, storage, energy storage, and, and what can happen, um, and the innovations that are happening here in material science or other places, that, those are things that are part and parcel of how do we get to where we need to get to. So all that stuff that's happening here at the, the university um, has an opportunity to be associated with that, I think, moving forward. But I wouldn't just limit it to UW-Madison either. They're, the whole UW system, um, there is a, a fresh water consortium that's being spearheaded out of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, but will include all of the campuses. And you know the, the connection between clean energy and clean water um, and the most valuable resource that we have for our livelihood, for economic development, for our, our lifeblood of fresh water is something I think that also has to be part of the conversation here. So I think there's room throughout the system to be involved in the innovations that are happening here. And, and as I mentioned in just the, the story about the, the one local school district, I mean, the UW students are also involved in this as well. And so the campus is already doing work in that regard. That's great. Okay, let's take a question over here. Um, the governor sits as the chair of the Dome team. Yeah. And he has great influence in, in that seat. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned new buildings, which are very important and certainly can be, through the building commission's influence, raised in terms of their sustainability, their energy performance, et cetera. We have Are more buildings that exist that are continuing to operate at their efficiency level, which is certainly less than, than the new buildings? Uh, is there, could there be a connection between the Energy and Innovation Office and the Building Commission to address that huge inventory that we have and become new? Yeah, I, I, I think. Um, that's one of the things I've, I've mentioned it 
somewhat briefly, but I think that's one of the areas where we can absolutely start to make progress um, on the existing uh, facilities. I mean, one of the, the things that, that's a challenge is um, the, the peak loads, you know, that uh, the utilities always uh, manage to what the, the absolute peak is. And by being more energy efficient in our own facilities as probably, you know, if not the biggest, one of the biggest energy users in the state, um, we can set an example and we can have a demonstrable uh, influence on that. And I think that's one of the things that in addition to kind of rewriting the, the standards for uh, building projects moving forward, we're trying to do what we can even in the existing projects that we inherited to, to do that. I, I'd mentioned that some of that, it's, it's not necessarily a, a huge cost differential, um, but it can be a time thing. But, but one of the things we're doing, I think there's a, um, we are going through and, and changing all of the, the lighting in, in all the state buildings to LED. And, and you know, that's something we're probably, I was in Racine, Racine, the, the city and the county of Racine did that 10 years ago with Cree, you know, and, and we're long overdue in doing things like that. So there's opportunities for us to do that too. I, I worked for you, you all, the ELA, and that is a, that's a thing that pays for itself. That's an easy thing to do. What I am referring to is as the MD Office of Innovation and Sustainability incenting the rest of the buildings, the rest of the facility, actually improve their efficiency. At this point, the problem is there's a budget for operations, there's a budget for capital improvement. They don't talk to each other. Well, within the no capital... There's no incentive to save money yeah, I, I, and, I, and we can do better. And this is, a, frankly, it's a, a, a pittance um, comparatively. I mean, it's a very large number. But I think in this year's capital budget, there's $25 million for energy efficiency in, a one, in almost a $2 billion budget. It's, be, it's been between $25 and $75 million over the last several budgets to do some of those things in existing buildings, but that's not enough. And, and there needs to be uh, a more creative view on how we do that. And, and um, I guess we've, we've been in office, the governor's been in office for almost nine months now, and, and all of you as members of the electorate should, hold, you know, you'll, you have opportunities to hold us accountable, um, but we are going through, you know, in, a, in whatever way we can and systematically trying to find those ways of who doesn't talk to who, and, you know, uh, the governor calls them the cylinders of excellence, you know, where, uh, you have somebody who does something over here and somebody who thinks they do something great over here and, and they never talk to each other. And so we're trying as we can to, to make sure we uncover those things and in as transparent a way as possible, try to fix them. Wisconsin's got a, two major sectors that I don't think is part of the, the, the discussion. One in particular are natural resource based industries, A, and forest products. Um, how do you see, or have, has the discussion been held with the, your colleagues or the governor's office? Um, that's a good question, and it's, I don't think it's something we have spent a lot of time on. I, one thing I would say is um, we have a new player um, that's come to the table in, frankly, the, just in the last few weeks, and, it, and it's a very important player when it comes to this. Uh, because of what the legislature did in the, at the end of the last legislative session or in the special session, um, by not having the governor be able to appoint the head of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, it kind of 
put a pause on some of the things we could do around the connections between economic development and energy and, 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 and you know, natural resources and a whole bunch of other things. And um, you may have seen that the governor appointed Missy Hughes, who comes from Organic Valley. She's been in uh, Madison just the last couple of days. She starts, I think, next Tuesday. Um, and, and, and so as we get into this discussion, you know, having all of those voices at the table, I think, is going to be really important. But, but I can't tell you that we have spent a lot of time on those specific areas to date. She's an excellent voice to address all this. Yeah. Over the course of what, like One year, a year? They switched. Yeah, it went from a vanity investment to something I've actually been making. For, um, which was a, a, a big shift. The follow up question is that is, is that, that is a huge role. The, the Time Magazine, the most recent issue, dedicated all to climate change. There was an article uh, written by the mayor of Paris saying, don't make cities. Sole recipient of clean tech. Don't just encourage the rich. And I think when you also look at the presidential campaigns in Iowa right now, you get everyone in past president past presidential primaries, every one of them are giving lectures on the role of energy and the impact of climate change. And I think we can learn that lesson from them. Um, just encourage you to ask. You yeah. and your colleagues to ask the questions. How do we engage the rural areas and especially the natural resource based industries to be part of this? Well, and it's, um, if I could. I'm afraid I'm going to get political for just a, a second here. I mean, those are not areas that are traditional, traditionally have supported, and, and lots of them didn't support this governor when he ran for election. And, and there was a book that was written by a Madison researcher about you know, the, the disconnect between Milwaukee and Madison and the, the more rural parts of the state. And, and I think we're going to great lengths, not just because it's politically smart, but because we represent the whole state to try to make sure that we are voicing that that these are for all those things. And even the fact that, you know, I guess it, it reinforces the point that um, that we can help follow and support where industry and local communities and local utilities are going already by what we're doing at the state level. You know, and, and that's a form of leadership in and of itself to allow things to happen, to grow up kind of at the local level and for us to be there to support it. One last time. The PSC recently opened up a docket on EV. And at the federal level, there was what's called an EV renewal. The renewable identification numbers is part of the IFS, the Renewable Fuel Standard. It's what the ethanol companies have to comply with, and the oil companies have to buy these brands. The e rent program rewarded. Uh, electrical vehicle charging uh, programs at the utility level, that they were provide generating uh, power from that oil and gas facilities, landfill gas facilities. Now, landfill gas is an oil digestion. If you have one right now, you are printing money. You can sell that gas to California or off the way to California. I mean, you want to drink this. Natural gas is like three dollars. I I meet your contract between fifty and eighty dollars effectively. The e rent program would reward utilities to install EV charging stations and fleet bought the digest Well that's has just stagnated. It's not going anywhere at the federal level. But that doesn't preclude us from taking the initiative to do something else. So there are ways of developing programs. Well, and I, I guess I'd like to, uh, when we're done, maybe we can chat a little bit more about how do we get you engaged in the dialogue with the right people. 
That sounds great. Um, let's take one more audience question. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet who wanted to? Okay, sir. Sorry. Well, At least if it appears to be, I'm, I'm happy with that. I, I hope it really is. It's a perception, and I want to talk about the perceptions that you mentioned before, which are behind politics, which is the driver of policy. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent uh, members of the administration, yourself included, you said the governor and the lieutenant governor from what I saw last weekend at the fundraiser, uh, way outside of town, by the way. Um, to what extent uh, you're showing leadership in your own personal energy sustainability and efficiency or use of renewables or a proponent in various committees or just at the time of strike, for instance, I didn't notice, there were some administrative folks there, I didn't notice any that were involved. To what extent is it necessary, possible, for leaders in the administration to visibly identify how climate change is affecting them, what they're doing about it personally, in addition to all the excellent policy conversations you've had with them? Uh, I think it plays a role. Um, if uh, if none of us ever showed up at an event and we got things done at the at the highest level that that made the changes that are necessary, I think that'd be okay. Um, but it's better if we can be there and and be part of these things as well. I mean, I guess I'd look at it very personally um, because. Uh, I'm laughing at myself, and you'll be able to laugh at me in a moment. So I've, I've put out about 350 miles in the last 24 hours going to various places. And so I left my car here and drove a state vehicle. I don't turn in my miles or anything, but for every once in a while, I take a state car. So that, that state car has been around, and I stayed overnight at my home last night and came back here, where my hybrid vehicle is parked. But I left my key for my hybrid vehicle back in Milwaukee. And so, so somehow I'm going to have to get, but so I try to demonstrate it in the vehicle that I drive. I have a 12 and 13 year old, uh, my wife and I have a 12 and 13 year old children. Um, and as much as anything, and, and it's stuff that they see in here. My daughter doesn't use straws anymore. I mean, that's one of the things that kids are doing. But, but they have a higher level of recognition about some of these things than do their elders. I mean, the world has been gripped by this 16-year-old uh, young woman who speaks so articulately and... Uh, can you say her name? Greta? Greta. Thank you. Because uh, I can't remember it sometimes. <laughs> um, but, but in, uh, you know, that uh, I think is, in some ways, we need those pe we need that generation to help lead us. They've, they've tried to do it on gun violence here in this country. They're doing it on climate change globally. We need to be responsive to them. And, and if my, you know, I think I'd go on my own volition. I'd be thrilled if my daughter dragged my, you know, butt to one of these things too, because, you know, she did that to my wife and I for a gun, an anti-gun rally uh, within the last six or nine months. And, and I'd like to think that we're going to be able to do more of that and we'll be led by people of that next generation. But I'm trying as I can to model those things too. So I think that is a great, inspiring um, wrap up to this discussion. Um, I Please join me in thanking Secretary Brennan for his honesty in <laughs> telling us about all of this. And um, we have a half hour here yet, so please feel free to mingle, talk to each other, have some snacks, and make connections where you can get involved and help out with this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you.